Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. Uh, once again, we're going to do a special edition of The Journey Home, um, as is the case with, I'm sure, many of the other programs with EWTN during this uh, time, uh, in which our lives are so constrained. Uh, actually, as the doors are starting <clears throat> to gradually open still, we're a bit limited on getting live guests for the Journey Home program. We're, we're, we do have some new programs that will be shown recently, but uh, a couple weeks ago, I had the opportunity uh, with the encouragement of EWTN to do a, what I called a hybrid Journey Home program in which uh, I included uh, a program that I do for the Coming Home Network called Deep in Scripture. And I did a solo presentation on that Deep in Scripture program with some thoughts about uh, the coronavirus pandemic that we're going through. And I do want to thank so many of you that I sent very kind words and emails. I'm glad that program was an encouragement to you. Uh, uh, I did it for myself in a way to, to put some thoughts out about things that I was struggling with during this prime time. So I'm glad that so many of you were kind in your responses to that. But we had not again planned that we would do that deep in scripture for the Journey Home program. And again, it kind of happened again. A couple weeks ago, um, I taped a Deep in Scripture program with my son, John Mark. He's the uh, chief, chief operating officer for the Coming Home Network. And often I'll have him or others on my staff join me for Deep in Scripture. And we did that. And we did it in a particular genre of the Deep in Scripture program called Memorable Verses. And so this is what we're going to show you tonight on this program. And again, I hope this is an encouragement to you. One of the bigger differences is that last program I did, I did in my office with my computer. This one we did in the studio. So it's a, maybe a little better broadcast than that last one I did. But <clears throat> this particular genre of deep in Scripture has been a lot of fun for my guests and I. What I do is I invite a guest to join me for deep in Scripture. And they're supposed to pick out a verse that has helped them get through this difficult time. And I pick out one that I'm going to use. But we don't know each other's verse. So when we get together in the Deep in Scripture program, <clears throat> I begin sharing my verse and then talk about it and then invite my guest to also talk about the verse that I've shared. And then when I'm done with that, then I ask my guest, okay, what, what verse did you bring to the program? And my guest shares their verse, talks about it, and then we talk about that. And then we end the program by saying, okay, how did these two verses that we brought together, that e neither of us knew what each person was going to bring, how did they fit together to help us in our walk with Jesus Christ? And so that's what I invited my son, John Mark, to do in this program. So let's take a pause, and now let's listen to uh, the first half of the recent Deep in Scripture that I did with my son, John Mark, and I hope you enjoy this presentation. Good afternoon and welcome to Deep in Scripture. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. Thank you again for joining us. We're coming to you now at the very end of April 2020. I just thought I'd mention that for those of you that might hear this in the future, so that puts us in context. Uh, I'm joined today by my oldest son, John Mark, who's coming to us from the, I guess you would call the northern headquarters of the Coming Home Network up in Perrysburg, Ohio. Hello, John Mark. Hi, Dad. Good to see you. So we're we're going to do this deep in scripture uh, in the the genre of what we call the memorable verses. I've asked John Mark to come loaded with a verse that he has found helpful during this difficult time of this this uh, pandemic. Uh, for those of you again that are listening, maybe in the future, and wonder we're at that stage where here we are, John Mark and I are both in Ohio and. Even as we were talking before the program, we're within a couple of days of the governor of Ohio, I, we think, starting stages to uh, let us, uh, you know, come out of the darkness, uh, out of our caves and back into reality. And, and we're all, everybody wondering, 
how much of life will be the same once all these uh, constrictions are removed from us, right, John Mark? I mean, yeah. uh, I mean, I would say our lives are a little different. Um, you know, in, in my case, your mother and I are out in our pristine little rural retreat in the woods. And in some ways, our lives haven't changed a lot. We just don't go out to eat anymore, or we don't go out very much. <laughs> Your life's a little different, right? A little different, although I, we're probably in a similar camp to you that uh, much less affected than many people by this whole situation because we, we homeschool, and I'm blessed to be able to work very close to home. Uh, and so throughout this process, it's been uh, it's been obviously an inconvenience and a lot of uncertainty like with everybody else. And, but you know, we've been blessed to be able to use this extended Lent and yeah. Easter season to to have a lot of good uh, family time. So, Trying yeah. to make the best of it. The <laughs> hardest thing for us is, you know, we we're three and a half hours away from John Mark and his family. So since the since the end of February, we yeah. we haven't been up to see the grandkids. You know, yeah. and we see them on Facetime once in a while. And I know even Teresa's mother. Right, doesn't get close. She, she's, no, yeah, she comes out once. She's come a couple times to to read to them through the screen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's a difficult time. It's a time we never imagined. Um, and so I asked John Mark to come loaded with a scripture that's Im important to him during this time, and and I did the same. Um, and and I, I'm taking you off the hook, John Mark. It doesn't have to be one you've memorized. <laughs> uh, and that's why it is. a piece of it memorized. Well, that's very good. In other words, when we first began the memorable verses, it was a verse that we'd memorized, you know, that, and, and uh, of course, I got to do one every time I do a deep scripture. So my, my old yeah. brain cells are kind of getting a little thin here. But I've chosen my scripture today is not so much a verse that I've memorized, but it's one I've, in a collection of verses, I've always been very aware of. And I believe that they're, a, a, a collection it connects with a collection of verses that I believe um, because they're more difficult both to explain as well as to live out that they're often forgotten and I think during this time uh, when I read it you'll see why uh, uh, it at least is something to think about so the verse that I'm bringing to the table for today comes from uh, one of the shortest books of the New Testament, and it's a, a book that, it, because of that, it's buried away, and often a lot of people forget about it and don't read it, and that's the book of Jude. And uh, for those of you that wonder, where's that at? Well, it's, it's right before Revelation. So it's the second to the end of the New Testament, um, and it's right after uh, the letters to John. The, letter, the, the, the letters of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and then there's Jude tucked away. It's just a one-chapter book. Most people, most scholars are not in agreement on all kinds of things about who wrote it and when it was written and all that, but uh, this book begins by saying that the author, Jude, was a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. So that connects him with another book, the book of James, and James was the bishop of Jerusalem, the, one of the first bishops of Jerusalem, one of the apostles. And this Jude, his brother, may have been one of the apostles, or at least you can see how close he was. All right. So the verse that I'm looking at is, is verses 17 through 23. 17 through 23. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read these in two sections. I'll read the first and then section, and then, the, and then I'm going to add some verses from elsewhere before we get to the second section. Here's what he says in verses, the first section, 17, verses 17 through 19, I think. Yes. But you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you, in the last time, there will be scoffers, following their own ungodly passions. It is these who set up divisions, worldly people, devoid of the Spirit. Now, the reason I, I pick this is because 
in the history of the church, whenever we go through tough times, especially really tough times, whether it was the plague in the third century or or uh, the fall of Rome, or when there were three popes at the same time in the 14th century, or the Reformation, or the wars of the 20th century, the depression of the of the 1930s, um, all this stuff, people will will wonder, is this it? Is this the time? Because our Lord talked about it, the apostles talked about it, the church has talked about it. We sit, we talk about the end every time we say the creed. We talk about we believe in the second coming of Christ. You know, we we believe in that. So the question is, when we go through really difficult times, especially, and again, I, the reason I bring this, I've heard a lot of people on the internet, Protestant and Catholic, talk about this. Just saw a new book came out recently, um, all about this is it. Uh, of course, back in the 80s, I remember as a young Christian, you know, it was a book called 1988, 88 Reasons Why He's Coming in 1988, you know, and of course, then he had to reprint it in 1989 because he didn't. So is everybody looking for things? And but but what's interesting about this is Jude says, "Remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you, in the last time there will be scoffers, following their own ungodly passions." Now, what he's doing is he's reminding these early Christians that it was the our Lord Jesus and the apostles that told them about the last times. And if you look at it through the, the eyes of St. Augustine, first of all, we are in the last times. And the last times began with the ascension of Jesus and extend for the whole time of the church until the second coming. That's the last times. But we also know that they predicted that those times would come to a, an end. And we go through difficult times. Now, some people think that we're going to see nothing but a new springtime ahead, whereas as Scripture talks about, it's going to get tough. There's going to be suffering and trial and and all kinds of compromise and, and apostasy. And what I thought I'd do before I go on to the rest of Jude, I'm going to read to you just four quick Scriptures that show that it was the common writing of the New Testament. Jesus said in Matthew 24 and 25, Watch therefore, if you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. Therefore you also must be ready. The Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. St. Paul said in 2 Timothy, But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of stress, for men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding a form of religion but denying, denying the power of it. St. James said in James 5, You also be patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. And then St. Peter in 1 Peter said, The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, keep sane and sober for your prayers. Above all, hold unfailing your love for one another. So on the one hand, the almost unanimous opinion of the New Testament writers with our Lord Jesus is that we're on the edge. We're living on the edge. Jesus says, watch, be ready. In fact, it was in the parable of the the ten maidens with their lamps, and three of them had the oil, and, and, and I mean, five had the oil, and five didn't. And, and he came. And so he says, you got to be ready. And then Paul and James and Peter all talked about the last days. Now, the, the problem has always been this tension. You either have the people that say, well, obviously we'd be here for 2,000 years, so they were wrong. Paul and James and Peter were wrong. He didn't come again. It was all wrong, and so you ignore those things. They were just screwed up. Even Jesus was wrong. Some will say that. He was, you know, in his humanity. He didn't even know himself, he says. So some will go that extreme. Then we have the other extreme, which basically every time a newspaper headline says something's bad, they say, well, now it's the time. Now it's the time. Now it's the time. 
I remember Paul Thigpen right before the year 2000 when everybody, I was one of those that was thinking that Y2K was going to have, I didn't think it was the end of the world, but I thought it was going to have an impact on, re- on the recession because computers were all going to get messed up. But the point was, I remember Paul, I know he maybe said it on the Journey Home program, but he talked about it, that, that, that whenever, the more zeros you have in a year, the more people would get excited. You know, 1900, everybody thought it was the end. 2000, there's three zeros. So that's good. You know, in the year 1000, there were all kinds of people. So the question is, well, do we ignore it because they made mistakes? Or do we, or do we, if we live it as if it's the end now, well, then what are we going to do tomorrow? Do I put investment in the future? Do I care about my family? Do I, do I, do I keep this job? There, I know some people, some evangelical Christians, fundamentalists that, they, they, they didn't ever get married because they were assumed the rapture was coming, so why get married? You know, so, so the point is, so how do we understand these verses? What do we do? And the truth is that these writers, in, if, you, if you read their entire context, never said, hide in the closet and wait for him to come. There was always this already, not yet, this both and. And the tension of that. How do you live as if this is it, but yet live like that for maybe a long time? How do you balance that? And these writers talk about that. They talk about, for example, St. James, be patient, establish your hearts. St. Peter says, keep sane and sober for your prayers, above all holding, unfailing the love for one another. So, That's the background. And Jude says, remember what the apostles said. Because the apostles talked about the imminency in our life, whether he's going to come in the clouds or tonight. If we meet Jesus tonight, are we ready? So what do we do? And that's the rest of the passage that I want to read in Jude, where Jude gives, if you will, five plus bullet points on what we're to do. And here we are in the midst of this crazy time. What do we do? And here's what he says. But you, beloved, number one, build yourselves up on your most holy faith. Build yourself up on your most. Take this time. Hey, guys, read the catechism. Read scripture. Hey, we've got a guide. Read the Bible. In the, it's called, it's a, great, a new title. Read the Bible in the Catechism during the pandemic. That would, <laughs> number one, build yourselves up on your most holy faith. Number two, pray in the Holy Spirit. Pray in the Holy Spirit. Number three, keep yourselves in the love of God. Remember, he loves you. No matter where you go, he loves you. Even when you're walking through some crowded store when everybody's got masks on and keeping everybody apart with 10-foot poles, remember, God loves you. Keep yourself in the love of God. Number four, wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. There's that watching and waiting every day for the rest of your life, no matter how. There's no promise, folks of a long life. That's the biggest thing that's driven this whole coronavirus thing is fear of death. When the truth is, we're finding out more and more and more that few people die from this thing than they really predicted. But it's driven by fear of death. Don't be, wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And then number five, okay, so you build yourself up in your faith. You're praying in the Holy Spirit, keeping yourselves in the love of God. You're, then you're patiently watching, waiting, be ready, as our Lord and the apostles said, number five, and convince some who doubt. Save some by snatching them out of the fire, and on some have mercy with fear, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. This reminds us that if we had, if we only had, if we found out we only have t- two weeks to go, Is there somebody in your life that doesn't know Jesus Christ? Is there somebody in your life that needs to be touched? 
See, we live as if he's never coming again. We also live as if we're never going to die. We live as if everybody else is not going to die. So what is our urgency? But here they're saying, hey, he's coming. So get out there and convince some who doubt and save some by snatching, snatching them out of. Now, what's the fire? Where are they going to go if, if they don't have Jesus? It's a place called, and this is what, the 500th, what, this is the 1,000th anniversary of Dante? What year is this? The 700th anniversary of Dante? Something like that, yeah. <laughs> the 700th anniversary of Dante's trilogy. So, so what do you think, John Mark? Well, this is good stuff. I, I love this passage from Jude and, and all the, the supporting scriptures you mentioned, and especially the, the thread that you were, you were weaving through them which is this mystery of the moment, of the present moment. And of course, that's something that's echoed throughout the, the great script, uh, spiritual writers uh, through the ages since the scriptures were put down. Uh, particularly this, the mystery of the day, of the moment, of the hour. You know, we, we spend so much of our lives caught up in worrying over, ruminating on the past or brooding about the future and trying to make plans accordingly. And that's really what, of course, the desire to have a prediction is about. It's about having some sort of control. If I know what's going to happen the next moment, the next hour, the next day, the next week, I can I can dispel that mystery. But we, we of course, as, as Christians, especially as Catholics, we, we're about the mystery. We're about not trying to, to get rid of the mystery, to explain it away, to simplify it. When, when the, the church, guided by the Holy Spirit and sacred scripture, give us these mysteries, we try to live them out, and we don't try to simplify them or explain them away. And this is one of the, the biggest ones, which is that, yeah, as you said, it's the that we're always already near the end. We live in that tension. Um, and I especially love the, you know, the, the second bullet point, if you will, that Jude gives us this, or the second and third one, really, build yourselves up. No, I'm sorry. Pray in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Where do we encounter the love of God? You don't encounter the love of God in the past. The past no longer exists. It's gone. It's, it's, it's simply in your memory. You can't go back into your past to find God. God is here with you now. That's where you encounter God. You can't encounter God in the future. The future doesn't exist for you. Now is the one moment in all of eternity that you can encounter the love of God. So if you're going to, uh, if you're going to keep yourselves in the love of God, you have to find him now or you won't find him. And that's, of course, the danger of having these predictions, having things that, that pull us into the future, that pull us away from the present space and time that we are in, is that this is the one place and time that you can encounter God. And so if you're not going to find him today, you're not going to find him. Yeah. And so it, it's all about in the day, stepping into this love of God. He's always there. We don't have to go find him. He's already here. It's a question of whether we're making our, whether we're recognizing that presence and praying in the Holy Spirit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think sometimes the reason so many husbands hope he comes soon is because we have such a long list of chores we've been putting off forever, you know, but maybe they don't want to have to do them. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, this, again, it's that all those parables our Lord gave about the kingdom were all about don't put off till tomorrow. It's today. Uh, uh, we never know. So, and I, again, I, I too, John Mark, I love this list, a simple list of things. What can I do today? Well, they made the list. Grow in your faith, pray, keep yourself in the love of God, be patient, wait for the mercy of Jesus, and then talk about, share your faith. And that's, of course, the work of the Coming Home Network. I mean, that's why we're here. That's the reason we're here. And the sharing of that faith, you know, again, it, it comes after. It comes after keep yeah. yourselves in the love of God. Yeah. You know, we get that backwards sometimes. Sometimes when things are, are crazy in the church or there's scandal, our first is to jump, is to try to, to save and to correct and to, to call out. But we, we sometimes lose, leave the love of God in the present. We lose our peace over it. And then we're trying to correct and preach and proclaim only on our own understanding our own power, our own strength. And without God, we can do nothing. And so it all, we have to start by planting ourselves firmly in the love of God in the here and now, 
and only out of that place of God's presence and our trust in him, our reliance on, on his strength, do we, do we proclaim, you know, because it has to be coming from him. And I know you talk a lot about the virtues. Um, I mean, really, that fourth one, wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life, that's the virtue of patience and that's humility. I mean, that's what that yeah. is. And that comes yeah. before yeah. getting out there. Yeah. Is, is growing in those virtues. Well, I hope you enjoyed that first segment of our Deep in Scripture program. John Mark and I were talking about that verse from Jude. Remember those five points? Number one, grow in our faith. Number two, pray in the Spirit. Number three, keep in the love of God. Number four, be patient, humble, waiting uh, for our Lord, for His timing. And then number five, Again, as I said two weeks ago in, in that other special journey, up, we're to be a light to others. Who is there in our life in our life that we can reach out to? And John Mark importantly pointed out it's not about yesterday, it's not about tomorrow, it's right now. Right now. And second of all, before we get out there, those first things have to be first. It's growing in our faith, a prayer life recognizing that we live in the love of God, His grace, and then being patient, uh, focusing on how He's guiding our life. Let's, let's go to a break now, and then we'll come back in a moment with a, a special segment, and then we'll complete the Deep in Scripture program. See you in a bit. Welcome back to this special edition of the Journey Home program. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. Before we uh, return to the second half of that Deep in Scripture segment with my son, John Mark, we're going to show you another of our insight videos. These are produced by the uh, outreach team of the Coming Home Network. Our guest on this particular uh, insight video is Kevin Stevenson. He was a former Journey Home guest, former Anglican and Charismatic and he's going to talk about how Augustine opened his heart to the Catholic Church. Please watch it. I was in seminary at Oral Roberts University, and I was taking a church history class. And and at that time, we had to we had to select a church. Father, they actually, they actually said church father, um, people that had big influence on the early church, and Saint Augustine was one of them. And I was like, huh, Saint Augustine? I heard his name, but I never, I never read anything about him. And the first thing that came to mind was a city of God, and the book is like this thick, and I'm thinking I'm not going to read that. So that was the end of that. But lo and behold, as I was coming to the Catholic Church, somebody else said, Kevin, you need to read about Saint Augustine. And the reason I was brought to, to mind. Um, because part of the reasons why my marriage collapsed, I was unfaithful to my wife, if I can mention that. And, um, and that, was, that was some of the struggles that I had. And the issues of infidelity ran not only, it was historical in the male sides of my family, you know. And, um, and I've shared this before, and that was part of my healing. Why is it that I could not be just? Why is it, why was I living this shadow life, you know, and, and, and all the struggles with that? And those are the things I had to talk about in terms of my darkness and the collapse of my marriage and, and all the other things that I've done and, you know, as a young man. And it even goes back into my family history. There's been a history of, of infidelity that's destroyed our families in different ways, you know, and, and coming to grips with some of those things. So when I, somebody said, you need to read St. Augustine's Confession. Right? And so when I read that, um, it was almost as if it spoke to me. Because what St. Augustine struggled with, it was mind-boggling that a third century, fourth century person would write the stuff in a book, you know, much less for me to confess it to a confessor. And so I read his story, The Confessions, and, and that was my story. And at that time, my wife was Monica. And by the way, coming to the church, St. Augustine was a patron saint. So the book of Confessions became the book that, that spoke my life. That, that, that talk about my struggle. 
my struggle with my appetites, the struggle with my dark side, the struggle with, with my arrogance, this, all those things. St. Augustine spoke directly to that in that book. Plus also, too, being of African descent, he was an African, but he came from the continent of Africa, from North Africa. So that healed a lot of things about people of African descent not having anything to do with redemptive with church history. So he fulfilled a lot of things. Being, being an African saint, um, being a person that, that, was, that, that was arrogant, being, being a person that struggled with bodily appetites, um, having a profound conversion. To me, he, to me, reading the story, he had a born-again experience. That's the kind of language I could talk about. I mean, he, he was born again. And, also, so it, it, he, and plus his desire to understand what's true. He was, he, he was a Platonist and so on. So there's this rigor of academic, of, of, mental, of mental thinking about what is true. And just his mind is just incredible. So I was, I was deeply attracted to St. Augustine. And then, of course, his mother, Monica, is, is a type of what my, my wife had to deal with in terms of praying for my soul and me dealing with my own demons, you know, if I can share that. So St. Augustine is very, very dear to me, and I've read the Confession so many times. You know, it's a wonderful book. And I, I read the latter part of the City of God. I couldn't deal with the first part, but I did a, deal with the latter part, and it's, and it's treatise on the, on, the, on, on, on the kingdom of heaven. It's just marvelous. It's just incredible. So... Um, he's my patron saint. Um, it, he was probably the he was probably the one who probably prayed for me to come into the Catholic Church, being from being from the continent of Africa, um, dealing with appetites. Um, saint Augustine, I, I resonate with that saint, and I believe in the Eucharist. He's praying for me, you know, and uh, and so so that's my that's my attraction to Saint Augustine. I hope you enjoyed that insight video with Kevin Stevenson. It, first of all, let me remind you a couple things is that you can watch the Journey Home episode that Kevin was on. If you go to EWTN's YouTube channel or if you go to the Coming Home Network's YouTube channel, you can see the old Journey Home episodes to hear his whole story. And uh, I also want to remind you that if you go to chnetwork.org, we have lots of these insight videos as well as other resources that you can check out, little snippets that can encourage you as well as encourage someone else. But there's two quick things that I, I want to point out in this video. This is really powerful, what Kevin was saying. And the first thing is, Kevin witnesses to the fact that the Lord works in our lives, knows us, knows our heart, knows our past, as well as our future and our present. And he witnessed to the fact that God in his grace reaching out to him used this very conversion story of Augustine that connected with him directly. And that was how the Lord awakened his faith to a deeper walk with Christ and then eventually home to the Catholic Church. It shows how God works. And so if you have someone in your life that's lost, you can pray for that person that God would use that kind of a tool, whatever it is, an EWTN program, a a conversion story on the Coming Home Network website, or what can God use to awaken someone's heart? That's why EWTN, as well as the Coming Home Network and other apostolates, do these kinds of resources that hopefully God will use them to open someone. The second thing that I want to point out is this reminds us, if you will, the Journey Home program. Every week we're showing a conversion story. We're letting someone tell how God brought them home to the church. Why are we doing that? Because we're hoping that if you hear that story, it might encourage you or encourage someone else. Someone flipping the channel happens to find EWTN and there's someone telling their story and they start listening. And pretty soon, just like Kevin, they're saying, wow, that's just like me. And maybe by grace, their heart will turn home to our Lord Jesus Christ. So again, if you go to chnetwork.org, you can watch that Insight video again or other ones that we have on our website. Well, now we're going to turn to the second half of the Deep in Scripture program that I recorded with John Mark. Now, you noticed in that first 
half of that episode, I had the floor for a long time at first. Well, that's kind of the strategy we do with that. I had the floor. I was to introduce my scripture and talk about it. And that gave John Mark time to listen and get his thoughts together so that then the floor was open to him to talk about that verse from Jude. Now the question is, what, what verse was he going to bring? Now, I didn't know what he was bringing. So he's going to share his verse and talk about it for a while. It'll give me some time to think. Then I'll talk about that with him. But then the fun strategy comes when after we've both shared our verses, now the question is, how do they fit together? And I, I kind of challenge you if you're listening to this. So you heard our discussion about Jude. And we think about our time during this crazy time that we're going together. Churches are closed. Stores are closed. We're, uh, I love it when I see somebody on TV, they're, they're, uh, they're praising somebody and they get their 15 seconds on TV, but you can't see them because they got a mask on. We're going through this goofy time. And we talked about it, we need to live our life as if it's the end every day because we could meet our Lord Jesus tonight. Are we ready? Well, what do we do to get ready? And Jude said five things. Number one grow in our faith. Number two, pray in the Spirit. Number three, stay in the love of God. All the time, stay in the love of God. Number four, be patient. And number five, how can we let our light shine to others? So that was my verse. Now, let's listen to what John Mark brings to the table. And I may not see you after this is done this time, so again, I hope you enjoy this, and then I look forward to being with you again next time on the journey home. So let's sit back and listen to what my son has to share for us. All right, John Mark, what verse did you bring to the table today? Well, mine is one that I, I don't have the whole thing memorized. There's a piece of it that comes back to my mind often because it, we read off. We read it often in the Liturgy of the Hours. It's, I think, week one Thursday in the morning, and it's Psalm 57. And I'll, I'll go and read, read the whole thing and then just highlight two pieces of it that particularly always jump out to me. All right. So this is Psalm 57. Be merciful to me, O God, be merciful to me. For in thee my soul takes refuge. In the shadow of thy wings I will take refuge till the storms of destruction pass by. I cry to God most high, to God who fulfills his purpose for me, he will send from heaven and save me. He will put to shame those who trample upon me. God will send forth his steadfast love and his faithfulness. I lie in the midst of lions that greedily devour the sons of men. Their teeth are spears and arrows, their tongues sharp swords. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let thy glory be over all the earth. They set a net for my steps. My soul was bowed down. They dug a pit in my way, but they have fallen into it themselves. And this is now my favorite part. My heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and make melody. Awake, my soul. Awake, O harp and lyre. I will awake the dawn. I will give thanks to thee, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to thee among the nations. For thy steadfast love is great to the heavens, thy faithfulness to the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let thy glory be over all the earth. So um, the two pieces of that that particularly uh, jump out to me today, obviously the, the, first, the first few lines there, uh, be merciful to me, O God, be merciful to me, for in thee my soul takes refuge. In the shadow of thy wings I will take refuge till the storms of destruction pass by. So certainly in times of destruction or uncertainty, whether real or perceived, I mean, that's obviously part of the the issue that we wrestle with is on this given day and hour, this month, this weird time we've been through, none of us as individuals know the extent of the destruction, how big of a deal the virus is, how big of a deal the economic uh, consequences of the shutdown is, all that stuff. None of us know the reality of it. We're simply faced with this situation of uncertainty and turmoil. And so, of course, the question is, uh, in the midst of that, do we, do we shelter uh, in the in the shadow of the Most High, do we cling to God? And later on in that passage, again, this is the piece that that I do have sort of memorized, although I have a slightly different translation memorized because mm. I've just read it many times, and it, I love I love the wording of it, and I love sort of the situation it describes. 
I'm going to say it again in, in, the, in the, the words that I know. My heart is ready, oh God. My heart is ready. Um, yeah. I love that notion because, again, in, in, along with this, this theme of finding God in the present moment, in, in seizing today as the day in which I meet the Lord and I, I place myself in the presence of God, I keep myself in the love of God, I pray in the Holy Spirit, uh, that begins, it can't simply be obviously something I read and it's great in my head. I actually have to do something about it. I have to do things to place myself in the love of God. And the the fact that this verse even mentions the morning, I think is significant to me because that's for most of us, that's one of the ways that we do this in a, the most practical way possible. We get up and we start our day before the storms of destruction that our day involves, you know, the messiness of of perhaps the home routine and getting out of the house and breakfast and all the stuff that's going to come today, all the new headlines, all the new worries that the media are going to bring to us, all the conversations, all that. With with praise, do we get up and awake the dawn? And that's Again, that's what it says here. Awake, liar and harp. With praise, I will awake the dawn. And I love that notion too, because think about this image of awaking the dawn. Well, I can't awake the dawn. <laughs> God awakes the dawn. <laughs> The dawn happens without me. The question is, do I get up and place myself in the presence of the dawn and, and engage with it? Do I, do I take that, that moment at the beginning of the day to be aware of God's love, to set my course, to set my compass of my day by the reality of God's love and his presence? Because oftentimes, at least for me, if I don't get up and set my course, if I don't awake the dawn, if I don't make my heart ready, like the piece that you had from James too, what was the when you read from James? Earlier? Uh, yeah, it says, you also be patient, establish your hearts. Yeah, establish your heart. You know, if I, if I wake up and I just lurch, you know, drunkenly into the day, you know, stumble out of bed, my heart is just a million different directions. And it's so important that I, that I get up and even if it's for a few moments, that I establish my heart. I keep I put and keep my heart in the love of God, and then I face the day. Yeah. Then I wake the dawn. Yeah. When I, I know you haven't had a chance to listen to last week's Deep in Scripture when Jim joined me, but there's some things we said on that that kind of echo what you were saying. And one thing that I've really been um, confronted and convinced about the more I've been reading Scripture over the last couple of years and that is this importance of our hearts being right above every, above and beneath and as the foundation for everything else. Um, in the Old Testament, there are plenty of scriptures that, where God says, I don't want your sacrifices. I want your hearts. Um, what set David apart from all the kings? His heart was right. Even though he was a murderer and an adulterer, his heart was right so that when he failed, it drove him to his knees. Solomon, with all that he had, all of his great wisdom, all of his wealth, everything, he failed because his heart turned from God. It's about our hearts. And last week, Jim and I were talking about if God had a priority system, what would be the order of things uh, that we follow all the precepts of the church go to mass, all the rites, or that we live holy lives, or that our, in our heart we fear, love, follow, and praise him. What's number one to God? The heart. The heart. Because we can follow the precepts of the church perfectly, and we can have a pretty clean life, and everybody thinks we're perfect, but our heart can be wrong. But if it's the other way around— then our lives will be different. And then the, the masses and the sacrifices of the church make sense. And, you know, that's kind of what you're talking about, establishing heart, being ready of your heart. Something else that reminded me of, John Mark, is that it doesn't appear in, in Western spiritual writers as much, but it's very common in Eastern Christian spiritual writers about the importance of guarding mm -hmm. our heart. The, the, almost like, in a way, that's what Jude and others were saying during this time. 
guard it. Yeah. Um, in fact, that last verse of your passage, mm -hmm. um, which was before your favorite, they mm -hmm. they dug a pit in my way, but they have fallen into it themselves. <laughs> <laughs> I love that when it happens, of course. But, <laughs> but, but the point is, we have all kinds of voices in our life. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to say something now that might be controversial in some people's eyes. But I, many people look back in the history of the church and they see the division in the 11th century from Eastern Christianity. And they look in the Reformation and the division that caused and, you know, how bad. They, I think we're living in a more divided Christianity today than ever and it's partially because of the internet. And the reason is that today there are hundreds, if not thousands of voices influencing Catholics more than their bishops. Our lives are more in line with whomever we're listening to on the internet than we are to our local bishop. When in the history of the church have the hierarchy of the church been so overshouted by the voices of the internet. So how do we guard our hearts? Yeah. Yeah, you know, in your in your original passage there, so it, it, the the second uh, piece of that, uh, in the in this last time there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. When we talk about our heart, we talk about the kind of the movements of our heart, you know, what's our heart attached to. And one of the points of, you know, of, of kind of setting the course from our heart kind of pointing ourselves in the right direction and then guarding our heart uh, is that it, there's great there's great power in that passion there's great power in the movement of our heart um, but we can but we can lose that as you say when we as we if we open ourselves to, to so many voices and we let the, let our peace be stolen then we become divided people we become people who like Martha are concerned and worried about many things uh, Soren Kierkegaard the, the Danish philosopher he described purity of heart. Yeah. Purity of heart is to will one thing, you know, and that's that's really the reason why where the state of our hearts is the first in that list of what's important to God, because our there has there can only be one uh, primary, fundamental, um, highest value of our hearts, one primary love. It's either God or it's it's a cacophony of everything else, and so that. Again, you mentioned the virtue of patience. Uh, Joseph Pieper, writing about patience, pointed out that we often think of patience as kind of what we do. We we keep from punching someone when we're already, you know, you know, uh, angry. Uh, we've blown our top inside. But patience means that long before that ever happens, that I keep the the cares and the worries and the anger and the passion at bay, and. In my heart, I guard that peace and love of God. I guard the, those theological virtues in my heart. That that remains the main thing. The main thing remains the main thing. And that's the that's the love of God. Yeah, I, those of you that have listened to any of my shows, and you know I've talked about the Beatitudes many times as a stairway to conversion. This was, um, you know, not my idea, but it's something that came from the, the early spiritual writers of the church. And it looks at the Beatitudes not as eight or nine separate things, but that there's a stepping stones. And the um, the sixth stepping stone is about purity in heart. And it's significant that it's number six. Because for our heart to be pure, we got to begin by getting the dross out of it. All the junk that we've accumulated over the years. Uh, uh, we need a good spiritual roto rooter in there to, to, to get that stuff out of here. So that's why Jesus says, well, you begin with poverty of spirit. And what does that mean? That means not being attached to the stuff of the world. The poverty of spirit. Again, we're talking about the inside, poverty of spirit. Number two, mourning for sins. Number three, meekness, humility, separation from self. Um, number four, hungering and thirst for righteousness. So once you've got the detached, you've gotten your attachment from the stuff and the attachment from sin and the attachment from self out of the focus of your heart, you fill it with hunger for with righteousness, and then you live that righteous out 
by being merciful. And in doing that, mm -hmm. your heart changes. So it's a process. It's a process. That's why even, you know, if you will, Jude said, build yourself in your faith. You pray. You keep yourself in the love of God. You wait for, you know, there's a process mm -hmm. of, of growing in that because our hearts yeah. are full of junk. Yeah. And that's why Jesus said, hey, it's out of your heart that comes all this stuff. Yeah. yeah. Right? So, mm -hmm. so what do you think, John Mark? Do these verses fit together? Oh, absolutely. So many ways. I mean, I, another thing I was just thinking here, you know, again, with uh, the mention of people following their own ungodly passions here, and with that, that beatitude being later on in the list, it's precisely that even— you know, we, we get the big sins out of our life. We get our passions, our desire for evil out of our for sin. We get that all out of the way. But you got to realize that pride is the deepest, darkest root that we still have in all of us. Yeah. And our passion can still be toward good things, but not to simply loving and obeying God as the highest thing. And that's where, you know, especially in times of scandal and crisis, we can our, we can tell ourselves and tell others that we're all about the truth. We're all about the, we're all about the good stuff, but we too, in a much more subtle way, subtle way, are being led around by our passions. Our passion, perhaps, to correct. Again, jumping to the end of that piece from Jude that you read, we we may be so passionate about convincing some and saving some and and uh, and and uh, you know spreading the word. That might be our what we're passionate about to the point where we put that ahead of keeping ourselves in the love of God. All that passion has to be tempered. All of that has to be set secondary to placing our heart in the love of God. And so then again, the, the practical note there, and again, that's the piece that I, I'm so drawn to this notion in, in Psalm 57 is that at the, at the dawn of every day, we, we, we discover to our surprise and delight, Oh, I get another day. I get, I get another one. I get another do over. <laughs> I, get, I get to try again. We have to start it out right. We have to we have to start by by placing and keeping ourselves in the love of God. We need to awake the dawn in that spirit, and then try to guard that in our hearts throughout the whole day. Yeah, I know you've heard me say that. One of the reasons I like getting up early in the morning is hearing the birds wake up because every day is a new day to those birds. Yeah, you know, it's an all surprise. That's what they're chirping about. Whoa, what's this? Look at that! Wow, you know, <laughs> hey, whoa, where'd this limb come from? I mean, they're just a joy. It, it, it's it's all about joy. And I, I was thinking, John Mark, again, that verse you had, you know, your heart's being ready, being ready. That reminds me of that James passage where it says, establish your hearts. He didn't end there. He didn't just say establish your hearts because you might say, okay, well, why? How do I gauge establishing my hearts on what? But the rest of the sentence is establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Yeah. You're going to stand before God. Mm -hmm. That's why we're establishing our hearts. Because someday our hearts will be laid bare. Because God knows what's in our hearts, Scripture says. Right. He knows what's... We can't hide a thing. Mm -hmm. so. And Jude warns us against uh, establishing our hearts for the coming of the kingdom tomorrow. <laughs> or next week or next month or maybe when I'm old and I've retired and I can relax and think about it more. No, the coming of the kingdom is today. This is the day the Lord has made. This is the, the moment that I can encounter God. They may not be a future. I'm not promised this next hour or the next day or next week. Um, I can only encounter God in the moment. All right, John Mark, that was excellent. It was fun doing that with you. Yeah, me too. Thanks. Thanks for joining me today. I hope to have you back on the program sometime. And, of course, I hope to see you guys sometime, too. If the, yeah, hopefully one of these days, <laughs> you know, that the things let up and we can come out of our holes, as you said. <laughs> our hobbit holes. That's right. That's right. Thanks, John Mark. Thank, Thanks, Dan. And all of you, thank you for joining on this episode of the Deep in Scripture. I hope it was an encouragement to you. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Just go to chnetwork.org and... Uh, and there's all kinds of opportunities uh, to get connected with us and with one another as together during this difficult time, we guard our hearts, we keep our hearts ready, and we establish them. And uh, I encourage you to look at both the verses we've mentioned and pray about how through the Holy Spirit they can help you and I grow closer to our Lord Jesus Christ and being ready to meet him face to face. God bless you. See you next week.